Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What is the first word you think of when you hear the word or title, judge? Judge. Before you think too much about it, turn to your neighbor and tell them and share with them what first came to your mind and be clean. Go ahead. When you hear the word judge, what comes to mind immediately? Remember, there's no swearing in church. Some people might think of Flip Wilson. You remember Flip Wilson? He's the one who dressed up in a black robe and says, here come the judge. Others might think of Judge Judy. Others might think of the person in the black robe who hands down the jail sentence. Well, in the story, we come to a 300 year period known as the period of the judges. A book in the Bible named Judges. In the Old Testament, while these judges could, uh, could throw you in jail, they were known for getting God's people out of jail. 700 years after God promised, promised to Abraham, the people of God are in their land, finally, at long last. God is present in the tabernacle. Praise God for that. And a law, guide, a law guides their life and their sacrificial system that exists for the forgiveness of sins. The people are truly and truly blessed by God. But there is a problem. There's a problem. And the problem is sin. Sin that still reigns in the hearts of the people. Sin that continually raises its ugly head. Israel made two mistakes when they made two mistakes after conquering the land that we heard about uh, today in the Old Testament reading. The first mistake is that they did not drive out all the Canaanites, and this led to the sin of idolatry. Last week, as we were reading the story of Joshua, you know, a lot of us were very upset about all the people who were killed, this, the mass slaughters that took place. And it wasn't because God hated them. The reason why he ordered that everyone be killed, be massacred in that way, using terms that we would use, is because he wants to purge all forms of idolatry from the land. Well, that didn't happen. God's people did not drive out all the Canaanites. And this led to the sin of idolatry. We heard about that today in the Old Testament reading. Every time God appointed a judge to serve, the, God was with the judge. God's Holy Spirit was on the judge. God was leading and guiding the judge. The people could come to the judge and the judge could give them right guidance and things were going fine. Their enemies would try to attack them, and, and, uh, and, and, and yet God's people would prevail. But when the judge died, and they were in a period of time where they were without a judge, the people immediately fell back into their old ways. And they then started going after the gods of the land that they conquered. They were going after the Baals. They were going after the Asherahs. They were adopting the gods of society. You see, our environment for us today, an application for us today, our environment can influence us toward wrong if we're not careful. Just like the environment of God's people of yesteryear, they were constantly being pulled away again and again and again. The other mistake that they made when they conquered the land, the first mistake being they didn't drive out all the Canaanites. The second mistake was 
They did not teach their children about God. And nor did they teach their children about God. They did not teach their children about God's great act of deliverance. I met with a young couple yesterday and uh, they're going to get married. And in the course of our conversation, uh, the young lady told me that her parents, uh, though her parents grew up in a Christian church, in a Roman Catholic church actually, that when she was born, her parents never insisted that she go to church. That they wanted her to make up her own mind. Let her follow her own path. And that's what happened with the people of God. The parents here let their children follow their own path. And as a result, they didn't know about God. And they didn't hear the stories about God. And as a result, they constantly fell back into following pagan worship. The idolatry, the, the very thing that God wanted them to stay away from. Those are the consequences. For us today, think about it this way. Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. One generation away. After you're gone, who's left? Think about that. So there are four movements that, uh, that happen in a repeated cycle in the book of Judges. And, this, and what's amazing is you'd think that, that we as human beings would learn from our mistakes, wouldn't you? You'd think. I don't. And neither did these people. They repeated this cycle six times. Six times. And here's what happened. The first thing is that they sinned. They sinned. The people worshiped a pagan god. Yet God wants to be first in our lives. I mean, listen to this, what God says about, what God says about this in uh, Psalm 34. Evil men draw their swords and prepare their bows to bring down the oppressed and the needy and to slaughter those who are godly. God wants to be first in our lives, but evil men, that is the world, wants to slaughter us, wants us to follow the way of the world. So that's movement, what I would call movement number one, and that is sin. The second movement is oppression. And this is what happened in the judges. The people would follow after the Baals, the judge would die, they would left to fend for themselves, they would follow after, follow after the Baals, they ignored temple worship, or they would uh, manipulate it for their own purposes. And so as a result, God removed his hand of protection and allowed the surrounding nations to overtake them. We heard about that with, with uh, Gideon and the Midianites. Gideon is threshing grain, and look where he's threshing grain from. He's not threshing the grain on the threshing floor. He's hiding in a wine press to thresh out the grain. And why is he hiding in the wine press? Because the thing is tall and he's a little runt. And, no, and the Midianites wouldn't see him and come and, and steal the grain. And that's why he was in the wine press. And that's what happened when, when people followed their own path as opposed to following God's path. Oppression would come, and, and which meant that the surrounding nations would come and oppress God's people. God used six, six, count them, six pagan nations to try to get his people to turn to him. The Meso Mesopotamians oppressed them for eight years. Eight years. The Moabites oppressed God's people for 18 years. The Canaanites for 20 years. 
The Midianites oppressed God's people for seven years. The Amorites oppressed God's people for 18 years. And the Philistines oppressed God's people for 40 years. If you add all this up, out of the 300 years that, that, that the judges ruled God's people, 111 of those years, those people were under oppression because they were following their own way. 111 years. The third movement, they would finally come to their senses and they would repent. Finally, at long last. The oppressed people would turn to God for help, would cry out to God for help. They would turn or, or return to the Lord, which is what repent means, to return or turn. They would make the decision to do a 180 degree change in direction. And then God would raise up another judge. He'd raise up another judge. And that's the fourth movement, and that's deliverance. Hmm. The thing that's so interesting and that's so important for us to notice is that God orchestrates the deliverance, not the human judge. And the other thing to note is that all judges are flawed human beings. We don't have time to talk about Deborah or Samson. I read across this bulletin cover. I hope you liked it. I thought it was kind of fun. It's a caricature of Samson and Delilah. And uh, Samson's weakness, which is his hair. And there's good old Delilah with the, playing Edward Scissorhands and uh, ready to cut off his locks. Um, but the judge that we're going to talk about is Gideon. We learn about Gideon uh, in, Josh, in Judges chapter 7. And what makes the story of Gideon so impressive, at least should be impressive for us, is that he is the weakest in his clan and he is the smallest. He says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I am the least in my family. <clears throat> you know, we think, uh, we think a deliverer is going to be strong. He's going to be mighty. He's going to carry a wallop. He's got a right cross that is going to knock anyone down. But God chooses Gideon, the least likely to succeed. If you think about it. And then God tells, tells Gideon to go and, and, and to charge after the Midianites. He, said, he says, I'm going to be with you. They can't touch you. They can't hurt you. You know, pull your army together and hit the road. And so uh, Gideon pulls together his army. And he pulls together quite a substantial number of people. 32,000 people to go up against the Midianites. Yay, God, right? We've got strength. We've got power on our side. And through a, a series of conversations with Gideon, uh, Gideon uh, sends some of the soldiers home. He says, oh, we don't need you. We've got plenty. And God said, uh, didn't say you've got just the right number until he got that army reduced from 32,000 down to 300 to face an entire nation. 300 men. God did this so that the deliverance would, would be from God and not because of the might of the army. That's the lesson that we have to, that we have to learn, that we have to hold on to. God delivered his people because of his might, not because of their strength. And as we look at our situation today, and we look at our trials and tribulations that we go through, the same is true. God delivers us, he protects us because of his, because of his strength, not because of ours. 
Yesterday we had a whole bunch of people show up to go knock on doors. I was so happy to see that. So happy to see that. We could have sent out four teams, but we sent out three teams of two. And then there were a couple, couple ladies, two ladies I think were in here praying for those that go out. Always making, we always make sure that prayer is covering the activity. And uh, several of the people who showed said, I've never done this before. I don't know what to say. I need to go with somebody who does. And that is exactly the kind of person God wants. God could really care less how talented we are. God could really care less how eloquent we are with our words. He could really care less about what our abilities are. What he cares more about is our willingness. And think of Gideon. He's about to go and, and, and attack the Midianites, these people who have been oppressing his people for so long. They're strong, they're powerful, they've got weapons like they've never seen before. I mean, they're so terrified of these people as I said a little bit ago, Gideon has to hide out in a wine press just to thresh the wheat so, they wouldn't, so he wouldn't be seen. And God takes his mighty army of 32,000 that Gideon pro probably could have gone in there and wiped them out with that many. But what would happen if he did that? They would have all come back like this with their fingers in their suspenders saying, yeah, we showed them, didn't we? But he didn't. He didn't. He came back. They all came back. Not one of them with a scratch on them. Not one round on their side fired. Not one sword used. In fact, they didn't even have a sword. They had a bugle. And they had torches. That's all they had. And they ended up turning on each other and killing themselves. They came back and they said, we, you wouldn't believe it if we told you. Look what God did. And that's how God works then, dear friends. And that's how God works now. In our epistle reading, we heard these words that we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay, so that we would recognize that the power does not come from us, but from God. And God chooses to use each and every one of you, each and every one of us, Just as you are, just as you are. I told you at the, during the announcements that God brought you here for a reason today. And that reason is so that he could say, I love you. I have cleansed you and made you my own. Now go. And do the things that I've given you to do. Not worrying about your talent or ability, but recognizing that I'm with you as I promised. I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to abandon you. It may seem tough out there, but it's not going to destroy you. It's not going to crush you. Go and do what I've given you to do. And that's what Jesus said. In our gospel reading today, he breathed on the disciples and he said, as the Father has sent me, even so now I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And God gave you the Holy Spirit. He, breathed, he did the same thing. He breathed on you all when you were baptized and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I am sending you, so go. <clears throat> the 
beauty of our God and his love and his mercy is that uh, when we do sin, and we do, I mean, that basically, when we sin, that means that we don't keep God on the throne of our lives. He is not the center of our life. Because if he was, we wouldn't sin. We wouldn't follow after the other gods of this world, whatever they have, might happen to be. When we're oppressed, you know, our fellowship with God is broken. But the good news is when we repent, when we confess our sin, we have this promise that he is faithful, he is just, and he forgives our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And that's what will happen today in a moment. We'll be able to come forward to this altar for all the baptized and receive Jesus' body and blood to hear him say, this is for the forgiveness of your sins so that we can be strengthened to return back out those doors into the mission field to do those things that he has given us to do, recognizing that that our strength, our deliverance does not come from ourselves, but from God and God alone. May God richly bless us and encourage us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may it keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>